everybody, and thanks again for joining us here on Expanded Perspectives. Uh, that's right, you found us. It's me, Cam Hale, and as always, sitting across the table from me, it's my friend, my troublemaking amigo here, Kyle Filson Philly. What's going on, Brad? How's it going, Brad? I am doing excellent. I survived the 4th of July. I remember last year we were talking about how the kids were shooting all kinds of fireworks <laughs> in the front yard. Uh, but we did not do that. We did a different thing this year. We went to a friend's house. We swam in the pool. We barbecued, played dominoes, things like that, and watched the city put on a fireworks mm-hmm. display. Now, I will admit that we, earlier in the day, the boys shot some smoke bombs and some firecrackers and stuff, but nothing like last year. Last year was a little bit out of hand. Um, you know how it is. You, you get four or five, eight, nine-year-olds around, and you give them free run. Uh, my father used to do the same thing with us with firecrackers. You, you just set down the tailgate, and you just let them go mad. It's kind of fun. I understand that. But we kind of we downed it a little bit this year. We didn't get as heavy into the fireworks this year. But yeah, no, I, I didn't get a sunburn or nothing. I didn't even put sunscreen on. That's I tried nice. to get a little bit of a you know a, a golden hue to my skin. And a I base think, tan. I think I succeeded. I would go out into the sunlight for a while, and then I'd go back <laughs> out of the patio and play some more dominoes, and then I would get back out in the sun. I'll be honest, swimming is a lot of fun. But when I get in the pool with the kids, they all try to drown me. Yeah, they're not they're nonstop jumping on me, choking me cannonballing on top of me yeah it, it becomes a, a, a real workout you know what i mean so i'm just like no and then they're like dad are you gonna come swimming again i'm like probably not no. why because every time i get in there i have to almost drown <laughs> they don't understand that right they yeah. think it's fun that's right so i survived what about you how was oh, your fourth it was good times you know good times we were going to come out there with y'all then we got sidetracked with my daughter and next thing you know we're co- yeah it was a whole big whole big mess but yeah we had a great time we got to watch the fireworks we got to hang out hope everybody else had a great time uh, we're not going to beat this horse to death, folks. Our hearts go out to everybody that had uh, a little violence laid out to them this week. Uh, everything that happened in Louisiana, everything that's happened, and then everything that went down in Dallas. It was terrible. That's all we want to say. It was horrible. Let's all let's just get along, folks. Come on, I, it is let's enough all, already with the enough. shootings. Let's just let's let's work on some love. This is enough already. We're going to bounce into that. Outside of that, though, look. We love everybody. Thanks for being here. We're going to have a little fun. We're going to jump into it because I got something I think you're going to like. I know Kyle's going to like it. Philly in Missouri, in Thayer, Missouri here, it says, this is our buddies over at Cryptozoology News. They say that two people in Oregon County came across an unknown animal that looked like a mix between, are you ready for this, Brett? Yeah. A dog and a kangaroo. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Now, there is a 26-year-old EMT. Thaler resident by the name of Sarah Miller, and she told Cryptozoology News this past Saturday that they were on their way to her friend's house, and that's when they spotted the creature. Now, she says this, and I quote, we were driving on a blacktop road when this very strange creature ran across the road in front of us. It ran kind of funny, like a lazy loping movement, much like Kyle Filson. Now, she didn't add that. I might have thrown that in. Maybe I made that up. But she says that this animal was running on four legs, and it reminded her a lot of a skinny kangaroo. Now, she said it had gray skin, and the body was hairless. Mm. Well, now you're talking about almost like a chupacabra right? kind of dis- yeah. disguise. Now, she does say this. It was very dog-like in appearance, and it had notably longer hind legs. But she goes on to say that it had large ears and a very sharply pointed snout and a long, thick tail like a kangaroo. Mm. Now, that was strange. Now, she added that she'd seen a lot of coyotes before and that the animal she saw back, and this happened in 2013, it didn't look like anything like this. She said that it was a completely different shape, and it reminded her a lot of a skinny kangaroo running on all fours. She said, but there's no way there would be a hairless kangaroo running around in southern Missouri. Now, they were not able, it says here, to get photographic evidence. And then, of course, they talk about some of the other things and the, about the dog man they get into and all this stuff. But I think it's 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 a very curious thing where she starts talking about the gray skin and it's hairless because now it's a different shape from what we've been told, you know, is chupacabra right, and things yeah. like that. But it is something that's – what could that be mistaken for? You Man, know? I have no idea. If you notice, she doesn't say, like, the size. Like, she's not saying it was four foot tall or three foot tall. Right. She's just saying it was running on four, four legs and it looked like a skinny kangaroo. It had a real thick tail. My question is this. Was the tail thick, or was it just like some loose skin hanging off of that tail? You know what I mean? Yeah. Like, yeah. Almost like a sail, because you could say, oh, that was real thick. No, it was just like a sail, kind of, you know, I don't know. It just seems like maybe it would make it look funky or whatnot. I don't know. But it is very, very strange, nonetheless. A hairless kangaroo. 
nothing else. I don't want to see that. Man, that sounds terrible. That does sound terrible. Well, moving on, this comes from Lon Strickler's Phantoms and Monsters. And yes. if you don't check out that that website, you definitely should. This is pretty cool. This is about an account that appeared in the Chicago Tribune Uh-oh. on January 15th, 1890, about a ghost of a beheaded conductor. That's right. We did an episode recently about phantom trains. This kind of fits in that wheelhouse. It's pretty cool. It says, trainmen on the Lake Erie and Western Railroad between Findlay, Ohio, and Fostoria are greatly disturbed over what they claim is the ghost of a dead freight conductor. The conductor was killed one night last November at Arcadia, about eight miles east of this city, by his train breaking into two sections in such a manner that he was thrown to the track from the car on which he was standing and beheaded by the wheels before the train could be controlled. The accident occurred at a point where dense woods nearly arched the track above the rails, and here it is, the trainmen assert the ghost of a mutilated conductor who was known in life as Jimmy Welsh makes its appearance nearly every night as the midnight train going west from Sandusky reaches the spot where Welsh met his fate. The engineer and other officials of the train say that when these woods are reached, an object looking like a headless man comes walking slowly out towards the track with a lantern in his hand which it waves backward and forward as if searching for something. The trainmen are positive that it's the ghost of Welsh hunting for the head, which was severed from the body by the car wheels. They insist that this object is plainly visible until the engine passes by, when the phantom slowly turns and fades away among the trees. Two crews have already abandoned this run and have been transferred to other divisions of the road on account of this alleged ghost and the engineer who brought this train through a few nights ago was so terrified over the encounter of this headless conductor that when he reached this city, it was with difficulty, and he was persuaded to stay on the engine until he was relieved at Lima. He said that he could not pass through another such experience for any sum of money. Now that's pretty cool, right? Now, that came from uh, the Chicago Tribune, the newspaper, and these... You know, these guys on this train, they're seeing this headless conductor walking through uh, by the train tracks. And this is what we were talking about on that episode of Phantom Mm -hmm. Trains. It is bizarre, all these ghosts that appear around train tracks. What do you think of that stuff? It always goes back into us talking about, is there a way, I I guess, like we is it has to be leftover energy, does it not? It has to be, that's what it is. I think so. I mean, because why else would he be, man, I don't know, I just... I would hate to think that there's a soul or somebody trapped here, and that's what they have to do. I mean, what every they night, just, every night, that's all head. they do. Yeah, you just walk around looking for your head. That sounds terrible. Well, you know, we're always talking about you know where they're going to take technology as far as uh, maybe repairing the human body, what yeah. they can do to maybe repair your pets, things like that, and what they do. Well, there's somebody else is taking an extra step. This actually comes from Popular Mechanics. There is a Stingray robot that was created. This Robo Stingray, they call it, and it is powered by, get this, real living rat, R-A-T, like a rat, cells. What? Yeah. Now, it goes on to say this right here. There's a soft robotic Stingray, and it's made of rat heart muscle. Yeah. Now, Kit Parker is a bioengineer at Harvard. and He led the team that developed this robot. He says, roughly speaking, we made this thing with a pinch of rat cardiac cells, a pinch of breast implant, and a pinch of gold. That pretty much sums it up, <laughs> except for the genetic engineering. I don't know about y'all, but Kit Parker sounds like I'd like to kick it with this fool. I love the way he's telling it. It says that his robot stingray is tiny. Now, get a load of this. It's less, or a bit more, I'm sorry, than half an inch long, weighs only 10 grams. But it says it glides through liquid with the very same undulating motion used by, like, real stingrays. Now, the robot is powered by the contraction of 200,000 genetically engineered rat heart muscle cells grown on the underside of this tiny robotic creature. Really? Yes. It says even stranger this, that Kit Parker's team developed the robot to follow bright pulses of light, allowing it to smoothly twist and turn through an obstacle course. This can't be real, man. Adam Feinberg is a roboticist at Carnegie Mellon University, and he's worked with Parker's team before, but was not involved in this this robot, said this. By using living cells, they were able to build this robot in a way that you just couldn't replicate with any other material. 
you shine a light and it triggers the muscles to swim. You couldn't replicate this movement with onboard electronics and actuators while keeping it lightweight and maneuverable. It is really is this like it's a remote control like a TV set the way they use the light. And it talks about how they understand how to build these muscles from the rat's body and how they were composed of four layers of this sequential material. And the top layer is a 3D body of silicone material. And Parker says it's the same thing as the outer coating of a breast implant. And it's very flexible. And then the body, of course, holds together. So then they talk about the third layer is a real thin uh, uh, silicone. But they go into all this stuff. You start looking at this. As crazy as it sounds, they have built something that you're probably going to be able to use. Imagine, I'm imagining it if you've got to maybe do a surgery. Could you guide it by light? I mean, there's all the... Where do you go with it from here? I don't know. Where's my button? Where's yeah, my button? <laughs> the one that protects me from robots. You need, yeah. Right? Now, Parker says he believes this, that his robot is a machine built, of course, from living cells. And he says, you know, people ask, is it alive? He says, I think we've got a biological life form here, a machine, but a biological life form. He said, I wouldn't call it an organism because it can't reproduce, but it certainly is alive. So what they've woven into it, I mean, it's reacting to the light. So it's almost, it's just like a creature. It's reacting to it. Now, you know, you could split hairs, this, that, and the other, the whole thing. But it is very in interesting. Now, he does go on to say that, meanwhile, the robot, by the, well, the roboticists and engineers can see different ways to use biological cells as building materials. And marine biologists can take a look to better understand why the muscle tissues and rays are built and organized basically the way they are. So, man, I don't have, but he says this. This is funny. What do you take away from it? This is the greatest thing. We turned a rat into a light-guided stingray. Says, hell, all they need to know is that, and that it's the coolest thing they're going to see all year. I mean, he sounds like a great dude. Sounds like a lot of fun, or she, or whichever one. Sounds like it's amazing. I just, the idea of where do you go with it from here. I mean, this is this is the first step. We always talk about the first step. Man, I this know. This seems to be like the first step. They've really woven genetic cells of a rat's heart into this stuff and it reacts and swims it's going to be like a cybernetic organism right half half living tissue tissue and half robot over an exoskeleton it's a way it seems like it's not going to be long before we truly can replace any part of our body that we want to with whatever we, it's it's all going to be like we're talking about. it's all about money that's it it's all going to be whoever's got the money to do it it'll be able to be done man that is terrifying to me check this out though the fbi releases document with details of alien bodies spacecraft and planets this is pretty cool i saw that you had posted this and people have gone crazy about this yeah it's pretty interesting they say that num numerous governments around the world are slowly coping with the idea that worldwide population has a right to know whether or not we are alone in the universe. In fact, the disclosure movement has never been as strong as it is today, with countless military officers, government officials, and astronauts, of course, speaking about the existence of alien life and, of course, alien spacecraft. Among all the governments on the planet, it is believed that the United States has a lot of disclosure to do. In fact, presidential candidate Hillary Clinton has stated that she is, if she is elected president of the United States, she would disclose all alien-related documents and get to the bottom of this UFO phenomenon. I think that we've played clips of her even saying this. Of course, I don't believe it. You know, how many times do these presidential candidates say that they're going to do something and then it doesn't happen? Yeah, exactly. John Podesta, who was President Barack Obama's right-hand man and chief of staff under the Clinton administration, tweeted not long ago that one of his biggest regrets of 2014 was his failure to secure the disclosure of all UFO files and that the time to pull the curtain back on this subject is long overdue. We have statements from the most credible sources those in a position to know about a fascinating phenomenon and the nature of which is yet to be determined. But despite the serious attempts at disclosure, the government of the United States still maintains that they do not have any knowledge or any information related to alien UFO phenomenon. However, many maintain that the reason why disclosure hasn't happened yet is not because of the government. It's very likely that such a subject might even go far beyond, extending into powerful corporations and a tight group of international elites like the Illuminati, which we'll be speaking about on today's show. Many governments around the globe have declassified a number of UFO-related documents, which only proves that there have been extremely interested in the UFO phenomenon for years. However, not only have governments released classified information, agencies such as the FBI, the NSA, and the CIA have also declassified some of their most secretive files on UFOs and alien life in the universe. 
and getting to the bottom of the declassified FBI document, the original one can be found by visiting a link, which I'll put in the show notes, and it'll take you to the FBI's vault of declassified documents. Now, this is the same website that Nick Redfern gets a lot of his information from and is constantly plugging. And have you ever gone over there to take a look at that? I mean, there is mountains of information over there. Now, the declassified document, this one that we're talking about specifically, was addressed to a certain scientist of distinction and to an aeronautical and a military authority and also some uh, public officials. Now, the declassified document is in a letter sent to the director of the FBI in Washington from their San Francisco office detailing UFOs and extraterrestrials. Now, in this letter on pages 21 and 22, it outlines the following. Now, get this. It says, part of the disks carry crews. Others are under remote control. Their mission is peaceful. The visitors contemplate settling on this planet. The visitors are human-like, but much larger in size. They are not excarnate Earth people, but come from their own world. The disks possess some type of radiant energy. They do not come from any planet as we use the word, but from an etheric planet, which interpenetrates with our own and is not perceptible to us. The bodies of the visitors and the craft also automatically materialize on entering the vibratory rate of our dense matter. They re-enter the etheric at will and so simply disappear from our vision without a trace. Now, the article goes on to point out that just some, that some of these files that have been released to the public describe in great detail the, some of the visitations. And, of course, there's others that say this document is fake. But I think it's interesting that if you go to the FBI files, the vault on this, this is a website. Why would this document be there if this was not an official document? Exactly. And if that's an official document, then what the hell are they talking about? It's almost as if they know about it. Yeah. I mean, this is what this it's is what one makes those you things, scratch your head at night because you're hidden in plain sight. That's what it always makes it feel like to me. I think you're right, and I don't want to be one of these crazy guys that believes that all of this is happening, but I also can't ignore it. I mean, you know what I'm saying? Yeah. Yeah. I am a normal guy. I have a normal job. I have a normal family. I have a normal life. I do the podcast. It's not a big deal. It's a radio show. But when you start entertaining the stories of UFOs and alien abductions and and implants being put into people, and we've talked to dozens of people that claim that they've had these experiences, and I'm not saying that they're lying, but when you also see a leaked FBI document that's on the FBI's own Mm -hmm. website, to me, it's so fantastical that either it's totally real or... The FBI is deliberately planting this garbage to throw people off. You that's, know what I mean? Dude, that's a tough one. When you start talking like that, that's a tough one. Because it'd be easily to do. Yeah. I mean, yeah. they know that people are going there looking for this exactly. stuff. Exactly. And how many authors and MUFON members are just combing through this vault looking for documents just like this. Yeah. And then it tells a story so fantastical. You know, it almost to me seems like, man, it can't be real. Somebody's planting this as a goof. But I don't know. Maybe, like you're saying, (laughs) hiding in plain sight, it's it's real. It's almost the way it feels. It it does. It almost feels like it's like that right there. It's hidden in plain sight. You know, we always talk about it when it comes to Sasquatch or Bigfoot. You know, there's all these stories of the things they do, and they have infrasound and all this other stuff. When you finally, if we ever do finally find one, it's kind of remove all that mystery, and then you're like, oh yeah, well, okay, then what? No, it's just like a panda bear. Okay. It's another, it's another animal. You know what I mean? <laughs> yeah, yeah. It, because it loses all its allure. I mean, like, say a white-tailed deer is, like, very elusive. You know, this is a mythical creature. People have all these sightings and stories. And then one day, it's finally proven that it's real. You're just like, huh, well, you know, it's just a white-tailed deer. Yeah, it kind of gets, exactly. That's what we always say about Bigfoot. You know, what's the big I kind of hope it's not found, because I like the allure of oh, the yeah. mystery of If it's found, I mean, there goes, like, 30% of the content for this show. Yeah, it's all gone. I'm just, I'm sad yeah. then. I mean, more sad, yeah. I kind of like it not being discovered. Exactly. Pretty cool. What are we going to be talking about on today's show? I'm going to get into the disappearance of somebody that was a uh, it was it was a big thing when it went down, and it's something that's going to kind of hit a chord when we start talking about the names and all that stuff, folks. I'm going to be discussing the disappearance of Michael Rockefeller. You're listening to Expanded Perspectives. <laughs>
When we mention the name Rockefeller, usually the first thing that comes to mind is conspiracy theories and whispers of banksters and world control. When the name John Davidson Rockefeller Sr. is spoken, it conjures up images of an American industrialist and philanthropist. Yes, but also of a founding father of the Illuminati, the New World Order, and great leaders of one of the 13 so-called satanic bloodlines that control our history and our religious right. And when we bring up the place, Papua New Guinea, we think of headhunting and cannibalism, or the locals' love for sweet potatoes. Those of us even interested in all things crypto, this place brings to mind the Indava bird, or the Monacan's gaziki, also called the Papayan devil pig. It's said to resemble a tapir or giant ground sloth having a very long snout, or maybe even the Murray which was first seen by native villagers and was also claimed to be seen by two missionaries, which is a large bipedal amphibious creature, about six foot wide with short front legs, a long slender tail. It's said that the creature's head has been compared to that of a large cow with teeth as long as a man's fingers. You would never instantly think that this family and this place could possibly be connected in any way but nothing could be further from the truth. You see, it starts with a fellow by the name of Nelson Aldrich Rockefeller, who served as our 41st Vice President from 1974 to 1977 under President Gerald Ford. He had seven children, five from his first marriage, two from his second. Now, before Nelson became Vice President, he was the Governor of New York, from 1959 to 1973 and it was some time before this in 1938 to be exact that his wife Mary gave birth to twins and the last of their children together one twin being a beautiful baby girl whom they named Mary and the last being a handsome baby boy whom they named Michael Michael Clark Rockefeller was born May 18 1938 and growing up, his father knew he was going to be a man of great character for the way he treated his siblings and the other children. Michael attended the Buckley School in New York and graduated from the Phillips Exeter Academy in New Hampshire, where he was a student senator and was also an outstanding varsity wrestler. He went on to attend Harvard University, where he graduated cum laude with a BA in History and Economics. He then served in the U.S. Army as a private in 1960 and also had the privilege of going with Harvard's Peabody Museum of Archaeology and Ethnology to study the Dani tribe of the Western Netherlands, New Guinea. It was there he fell in love with the country and found his passion. And here is where our story picks up. A quote from the 23-year-old Michael reads, It's the desire to do something adventurous at a time when frontiers, in the real sense of the word, are disappearing. You see, during the Peabody expedition, he would help record the documentary Dead Birds, which was a chronicle of the life among the Donnie tribe. And after this expedition was complete, Michael returned briefly to the U.S., after which the lure of adventure drew him quickly back to New Guinea. But this time, it was to study the Osmot tribe of the southwest coast of New Guinea. And on this trip, he wished to once again live among the people he so loved and also collect various pieces of artifacts and tribal artwork for exhibition at his museum back in New York. Now, this expedition would prove to be much different and indeed much more dangerous than the previous expedition that was sent to study the Donnie tribe. Now, Michael was essentially on his own this time and embarked on this adventure with a friend of his, an anthropologist by the name of Rene Wassing. Their destination, the Osmot tribe. It was also markedly different than the Donnie tribe, which he had studied. You see, the Donnie tribe were mostly 
peaceful, agricultural people spending their days farming and lying about with family. The Osmot tribe was a little different. They were very fierce warriors who sported, of course, scars and weapons and practiced cannibalism. Now, this Osmot tribe also had a deeply ingrained culture of reciprocal murder. You see, in their culture, there was a profound sense of balance, and they believed very strongly that one death had to be balanced out by another. And in order to fulfill this obligation to avenge one death, they were known to set out on headhunting raids in which their tribesmen, searching and bloodlusting for revenge, would often descend onto this offending tribe and slaughter every living thing it could find in this tribe, including women and children. And in the aftermath, the blood of their victims would be rubbed on long bishy poles and their flesh consumed because the Osmot believed that they could absorb the good qualities and gain supernatural powers from their enemies this way. It's a very brutal way of life and it's a never-ending circle of violence. So this very dangerous place was precisely what drew Michael there. The potential for danger and violence was exhilarating to him. He wanted to experience life living among a tribe of documented real-life headhunters. And no doubt he was probably buzzing on some sort of high with this false sense of security that I'm sure he's been born with. But rather than being afraid, of course, Michael approached this whole thing with a sense of excitement and maybe a touch of complacency because he viewed the Osmot people as an enigma, something that he wished he could study and understand. Now, during his journey, he wrote this. I am having a thoroughly exhausting but most exciting time here. The Osmot is like a huge puzzle with the variations in ceremony and art style forming the pieces. My trips are enabling me to comprehend, if only in a superficial, rudimentary manner, the nature of this puzzle. Well, he would go on to take hundreds of photographs of his time with the Osmot people, and he did collect numerous artifacts. And out of those artifacts, four of them included the Bishi Poles, onto which there was blood of slain enemies smeared along them. These poles are still on display at New York's Metropolitan Museum of Art. Throughout this whole time, you have to imagine, though, that Michael probably never really felt like he was in any danger. Because, well, after all, he was a member of one of the richest families in the world. So he must have had a definite sense of invulnerability. That his family had in the past and could now bail him out of any trouble if it should come his way. And I'm certain that this sense of entitlement, no doubt, produced an illusion of safety, no matter where he was. So, on November 17th of 1961, Michael was on a very shoddy, ratty, makeshift catamaran and accompanied by his good friend, the Dutch anthropologist René Wassing, and two local guides on a trip to collect some Osmot wood carvings. And they were crossing a large turbulent mouth of a river that faced the Arfura Sea on the coast of New Guinea, the southwest side, when large waves flooded the engine and caused it to die. Well, unable to get it restarted, they drifted until the boat was rolled by larger waves. The two guides told them both to stay put and they swam to get help. And over the next 24 hours, Renee and Michael remained clung to the overturned boat as it drifted further and further out to sea. 
until it was close to 12 miles from shore with no sight and help. Michael said, we have to do something. So gathering up some gas tanks that he could find still on the ship floating, he tied them to his waist. He looked at Renee and said, I think I can make it. And then he proceeded to jump into the water and swim toward shore. Rockefeller, a young, strapping 23-year-old man in great shape, no doubtedly very proud of his family name, was never seen again. The next day, the help that the local guides had promised as they swam off arrived to save Wassing. Rockefeller wasn't with them. This very rich and mysterious young man, if you will, disappeared in a very rich and mysterious land. And of course, the media went crazy. It ran through the papers nationwide. And there was a massive search launched by the Dutch government. And for two weeks, they searched this area for any sign of Michael. But there was no trace of him. And again, Nelson, his father, and his sister Mary, we spoke of, his twin, both flew to New Guinea to help search for Michael. But there was just no sign. It was very simple. You see, it was as if Michael was swallowed up by time and he vanished from the face of the earth. Now the Dutch government, wanting to put a nice bow on this and move on, their official conclusion was that he had died by drowning. Even though there was no evidence to make this assumption, that's what they tried to wrap it as. But then a rumor began to grow. This rumor that he had made it to shore and had been attacked and killed and then eaten by the cannibals of the Osmot village. There was a part of the Osmot village very close to where these two men had been and they were known for practicing cannibalism. Now the rumor, of course, grew even further when Dutch Catholic missionaries in the vicinity of Michael's disappearance had detailed the cannibalism of a white man in 1962 in an Associated Press article. Well, the Rockefellers were no doubt unsettled by this, but the Dutch government was quick to claim that cannibalism was an outdated practice and not to worry because it no longer occurred in Dutch New Guinea, even though the people that lived there knew it most certainly did. Now, it's probably not surprising that the Dutch were in the midst of trying to ready New Guinea for independence, and they did not want any sort of this dark and negative publicity, if you will, of uh, cannibalistic headhunters running through the jungles and invariably attacking anyone that they felt like. So people believe this, that Michael had not been killed by cannibals, but he had rather been kept prisoner by them, or maybe that Michael himself had abandoned civilization and chose to live amongst them. No one really knew, though. And in 2014, Carl Hoffman, an author, published a book called Savage Harvest, a tale of cannibals, colonialism, and Michael Rockefeller's tragic quest for primitive art. Now, during multiple visits, Mr. Hoffman had heard several stories about men from the area killing Rockefeller after he swam to shore. The stories are very similar to testimonials collected in 1960s, but they center around this, that there was a handful of men arguing and they decided to kill Michael after he swam to shore for the revenge of a 1958 incident in which men from the village were killed by Dutch colonial officials. Now you remember, we discussed the balance that they believed in, a death for a death. Well, all of the men who participated in the murders directly benefited from the event, but wanted to avenge the deaths of their fellow tribesmen, or so the story goes. And then after the murders, the villages were swept by a cholera epidemic and believed that it was revenge for killing Michael. Now Hoffman says that as he was leaving one of the villages for the last time, he witnessed a man acting out a scene where someone was killed. So he pulled out his camera and he videotaped it. And this is what he says the man was quoted in saying when he had it translated. 
don't you tell this story to any other man or any other village because this story is only for us. Don't speak, don't speak and tell the story. I hope you remember it and you must keep this for us. I hope, I hope this is for you and you only. Don't talk to anyone forever, to other people or other village. If people question you, don't answer. Don't talk to them because this story is only for you. If you tell it to them, you'll die. I'm afraid you will die. You'll be dead. Your people will be dead. If you tell this story, you keep this story in your house to yourself, I hope forever, forever. Well, in 1964, Michael Rockefeller was officially declared dead. And this is where the strange mystery of Michael really begins. You see, on October 29, 1968, a rough man with an athletic build and scruffy beard strolled into the offices of Argosy magazine. The Argosy, as it would later be called, was a magazine that launched in 1882, and it was a very popular pulp mag, or more like a comic book without pictures, if you will. You see, pulp mags were fictional, and they produced things like the Shadow or the Phantom Detective. The Argosy shifted gears later in its publishing and became known as a bit of a racy men's mag, publishing tales of true crime that later became so popular that NBC picked it up and made a TV series out of it, running for 26 episodes and being known as the Court of Last Resort. But enough about this magazine, we'll get back to the mystery. This rather rough and tumble-looking fellow strolled through the offices till he got to the editor of Argosy Magazine's office, Mr. Milt Macklin. He walked up and introduced himself as John Donahue. He said he was an Australian smuggler, and judging from his accent and rough edges, Milt had no reason to doubt him. Donahue sat down and told Milt a story that he could hardly believe he was hearing. Donahue told Micklin that he had been in the Torbrand Islands ten weeks prior to his visit that day. The Torbrand Islands are a few hundred miles where Michael went missing. Now keep that in mind, as Donahue went on to say that he'd been doing a little swapping and trading with the locals of a very remote village on the island of Canabora or Canapau. He wasn't sure of the exact name. Either way, he said its coordinates was in about 8 degrees south by 150 degrees east. And while Donahue was standing around with the villagers, that a shaggy-haired white man with a sandy-colored beard hobbled out of a small dark hut. This man was using a walking stick because both of his legs had been very badly broken and looked as if they had never been set and healed quite terribly. Donahue said the man on weary legs approached him, squinting through dull and listless eyes. He eased right up to him and uttered these words, I am Michael Rockefeller. Can you help me? This is as far as John would elaborate, and he left Milt's office, but agreed to discuss it more that evening. But this meeting never came. The smuggler disappeared that night and never was heard from or heard about again. Milt thought it odd that the man never asked for money, didn't take the story to the newspapers, and didn't approach the Rockefeller family. But Milt didn't hesitate to pass along what he'd learned and quickly approached the Rockefellers. Somewhat shocked by their reply of they considered the matter to be closed, it began to eat at him, and Milt couldn't let it go that easy. So Milt decided he would go look himself, and that's just what he did. He took 10,000 feet of 16 millimeter film and two Bolex cameras with him and he hired a cinematographer and he headed out to New Guinea. Now though he never made it to the Azmat people himself, Milt managed to track down and interview several missionaries who were there at the time of Michael's disappearance. And he himself released a book in 1974 titled The Search for Michael Rockefeller. 
And that was pretty much the end of it. That is until a documentarian by the name of Fraser C. Heston got involved. A little side note about Mr. Heston is he played baby Moses in Cecil B. DeMille's epic, The Ten Commandments. Yep, that was him in the basket floating, folks. He made the documentary called The Search for Michael Rockefeller that was released in 2011. Heston tells of reading Milt's book, becoming fascinated with the story, and reaching out to Milt's widow with the hopes of getting to see some of his footage. He tells of that in 2008, he asked Margaret, Milt's wife, whatever happened to that footage? She said that they never really did anything with it, and eventually gave it to a stock footage house. So, Fraser started digging around, and turns out that the guy who owned it and had it stored in a warehouse lived in England. So they got in touch with him, and then about three months later, he said three boxes of 16 millimeter film with no sound arrived at his office. Now, Fraser goes on to say that he opened it up, started spooling through it by hand, and holding it up to the window. He said, because really, who has 16 millimeter viewer anymore? And he said, oh my God, this stuff is amazing. It's an amazing flashback to a time when the Osmok culture was nearly as intact as it was when those men were there. And it was also in color. Now, he thought it was a finished film. Turns out it wasn't. It was 15 reels of various sizes, maybe 10 hours of film, but that it had no sound. Now, they eventually found the sound tapes in Margaret's apartment there in Manhattan that Milt had hidden, basically, in boxes in his study. Fraser says it was an amazing treasure trove full of old trunks and leopard skins and elephant tusks and maps that he stumbled into there. And in his old filing cabinets was tape reels labeled Interview with Father Von Kossel. So he started syncing it up. And he said syncing up the sound to the video was an amazing job. Huge, overwhelming. It's like putting together a gigantic jigsaw puzzle. He didn't know where to start and where to end. He just had to wade into it and get started. But there's an interview with the missionary, Ken Dresser. He doesn't comment on film, but the cameraman reports that Dresser believed Michael was killed and eaten by cannibals. And of course, Frazier believes that Milt deserves a little more credit because he certainly first published the first serious book that really dug into and looked at the theory that Michael was killed and possibly eaten by the Azimuts for revenge of that Dutch patrol that we discussed. And that's where I'd love to leave you in this story. That Michael wasn't abandoned in some hut on busted legs, but rather that he had been eaten by the cannibals or maybe even drowned trying to reach the shore. That's where I would love to leave you all. But I can't. See, there's one little part that shows up in Heston's film that came from Milt's hard work. It's a clip of a video of what's been called Big Michael. In an interview done by Tim Son from Outside Online, Tim asked Frazier about this clip. Tim asks, it's the mystery that keeps on giving. Can you tell me about Big Michael? Frazier responds, I was in a hotel room in New York, sort of speed watching these DVDs I had made from the 16mm film. And I don't remember whether I stopped on it by chance or if I went by and ran it back. But as I progressed through it, one frame at a time, I thought, that guy's a white guy. And then my editor blew it up to see what we could learn. That's when we started calling the shot Big Michael. And there's just no question in my mind that this is not a full-blooded native asthma. And at that point, I just went, wow, this throws a wrinkle in it, doesn't it? So Tim asks, it's also kind of perfectly surreal cap to retelling the story. A fresh vein of mystery here seems only appropriate. In which Fraser responds, that's right. You spend all this time building up one case and then suddenly you find another layer that turns you in a different direction. So when we found Big Michael, I said, wait a second. I'm certainly not saying it is Michael. It's very grainy, it's very small, 
and there's really no way to do facial analysis or anything like that. But it does look, at least superficially, like him. So I thought, if it's not Michael, and it would have been eight years after he disappeared, who is it? As far-fetched as it sounds that he might have been there eight years later, paddling a canoe, that's kind of the uncertain world we're dealing with here. And that's part of the attraction of the story. And that is where I'd have to leave you. You see, folks, it doesn't matter if you're in the Illuminati, if you're part of the New World Order, if you control a mass sum of the world's money. When you have a passion, and you follow that passion, and you don't listen to your inner self, and you get a little far off the beaten path, and you slip out of the world that we're used to living in with comfort and air conditioning and refrigerators, and you go back in time, basically. Well, that world doesn't care who your parents are, doesn't care what family name you have, doesn't care where you come from. That world will only consume you and treat you like one of its own. And we're back with Expanded Perspectives. A very cool story, an interesting story. I like these stories where it's it's not known what happened to this man, but it seems like he was brought into the fold, and perhaps he was running away from his heritage, his lifestyle, his home, you know, back in America, and, um, you know, the air of his name and, and all the power that comes with that. You know, you hear about this from time to time, where there are people that are born into these rich families. And for whatever reason, they don't like it. They don't want to be a part of it. And so they act out. Lots of times they get in trouble or or they move off. They decide to be a hippie or or whatever the the thing is, a philanthropist or something like that. They don't want to possess all the material things that come with being a a family of big prestige. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Uh, You know, it reminds me of there was a, a documentary made on the History Channel years ago where they, they profiled guys like John D. Rockefeller, Andrew Carnegie, uh, Ford, and I'm trying to think, one of the Vanderbilts or something. And they were showing, you know, John Rockefeller, I mean, he was ruthless, and he built up Standard Oil. I mean, and he had a monopoly and made massive amounts of money. I mean, we're talking about redonkulous amounts of money compared to today's standards. Uh, I mean, if he was making the amount of money that he made then now, it would be like billions, okay? Mm-hmm. He'd be one of the richest guys ever. He was one of the richest guys in the world at the time. I think he was only surpassed by Carnegie at one point. But maybe Michael, he grew up knowing he was a Rockefeller. And, of course, they probably sit you down as a youngster. And they tell you about your family lineage and, and what's expected of you, okay? Mm-hmm. You have to go. Imagine being a little boy and you have to wear a tuxedo everywhere. And, and you're going to the these polo games and these galas and things like this. And maybe at some point... He kind of realized, you know what? Everybody around me is kind of just living off what my great grandfather did, mm-hmm. and it's kind of a joke. You know, we we know family members 
uh, are people in our own town that grew up with money, and you kind of see how they turn out. And everybody mm. has the same experience in their own town. You know what I mean? But there's always like a screw up, right? This kid comes from so much money and he's a screw up, and you grew up poor or lower middle class, and you're like, man, I wish I had that chance because I would totally do things different, <laughs> yeah, right? Yeah. That's because you're not born into it. So maybe Michael, and he was brought into this fold. He he was raised a Rockefeller. He didn't do anything spectacular to earn this prestige. And maybe he decided, you know what? I'd rather go do stuff in other parts of the world. I'd rather do something different with my life. And maybe when he got, what was it, the ship was capsized or something, they mm -hmm. lost it, lost at sea. Maybe he made it on the shore, and he wasn't cannibalized on. Maybe he was brought into a simpler way of life. We talk about it all the time, how much simpler life would be if we were living thousands of years ago, or perhaps if an asteroid or something hit the Earth nowadays, and we were brought back to the Stone Age like that. Maybe he just embraced that lifestyle. Maybe he liked it better. And he decided, you know what? I'm just going to live out the rest of my days here. I kind of like this. I don't have to worry about upholding this, you know, appearance wherever I go. I don't have to worry about making somebody mad because I said the wrong thing or didn't portray myself as a Rockefeller in quite the same manner. Maybe he didn't want to go to you know, school and do all these things. And, and maybe there's a lot of pressure. I think that's a lot of it. And it's like these kids that are born to these rich families, these super rich families. There's got to be an unsurmountable amount of pressure put upon you because of who somebody before you, mm -hmm. your ancestors was. And maybe he didn't like that. And he, you know, and, and what's, what always happens, they rebel. You know, everybody knows about like yeah. the preacher's daughter. What happens, right? <laughs> they rebel, yeah. right? Because they're held under the strict rule that you can't do this, you can't do you can't do anything. Yeah. And so they do the opposite. They slingshot. They they rebel. Maybe he just he liked that. Or maybe he was consumed by the cannibals. Yeah. The, but but it is interesting the video of what appears to be a white person. Well, and you can watch this documentary. You can find it. It used to, I don't know if it still is. I should have checked into that. But it was uh, aired on Netflix. You used to be able to look it up and actually watch the video where you can see the clip. And it was on Netflix, and you can and you can watch the trailer. You can watch some clips of Big Michael. I like what you're saying. The only thing that always makes me think of this is if he survived, I don't know why he would go over there and do all of this work for his museum and gather up all this stuff and send it back and send it back just to decide halfway through the trip he don't want to go back home. Right. I almost have a feeling like he was – it feels like this. It feels like he was taken. Maybe he was held captive. If he wasn't eaten, maybe he was held captive. Maybe he was put through something almost like forced to be there. And after a while, he just adapted as he knew he was never going to be home. He would, So he just made the best of a bad situation and just decided to fit in. I have a feeling like he got killed, like he got on shore and he got, I don't know. But after seeing that picture and that video, it almost makes you feel like, but also too, Maybe it was just another, you know, maybe it was another one of the uh, the colonists or maybe it was one of the other, the, the fathers that was there, you know, or something like that. One of the, the priests that was there trying to work with them. I don't know. But it feels like you kind of said, like, maybe he was wanting to run away and they captured him and it was just kind of the, maybe the best of both worlds of the whole deal. It does seem odd to me, though, that the story never got out, that they kept a real, you know, real tight lip on the whole thing. That they've gone over there and nobody seems to know anything about it and the whole deal. So, and I don't know. It is. It, it feels. It's one of those things that there's really no way to put your finger on it. I don't really know. I don't. I, I can't really feel a hundred percent one way or the other. Was he kind of a black sheep of the family? Do you get the impression? Not really, because I don't think there was such a thing in that family. I mean, it was one of those deals. I mean, you're talking about a, a distinguished varsity wrestler. You're talking about a boy that graduated from Harvard. I don't really think of him as a black sheep. What I picture him as is if you could see the cookie cutter, like I would picture him as one of the dudes that walked around in sandals and was like a mountain climber and kind of just a free spirit living out of a van and all that stuff. That's kind of the way I figured him, or the way I picture him if you see pictures of him. He seems like those guys, but he's also one of those dudes that's, He's very adventurous because he had that money. He had that air of invincibility, that untouchableness to him. So it, it does seem strange. But it goes back into that whole deal of like we discussed is there still places on this planet. I mean, that wasn't really that long ago, but that where you can still go missing, that no matter what they do, you're talking about the most powerful family at the time with all this money and all this outreach and the control. And even they couldn't find their son. 
Right. So, you know, he was he goes missing. And then, you know, not long after his father becomes the vice president, and all this didn't help him, didn't save him. So it just shows you that no matter what control you think you have, there's still parts of this world that they don't care what your last name is. Well, I like that you point that out even in your story. Yeah. Is that there's parts of the world where it doesn't matter what kind of influence your family no. has. Once you're brought into that fold, you're just as as normal as everybody mm-hmm. else. And, and maybe he wasn't. Maybe he was revered because he was white. I know Justin Wren talks about when he's there with the pygmies. That they look at him like almost like a god because like he's a so ghost. different, right? Yeah, he was so they didn't know. They thought he was something, yeah, like a big white gorilla. They kind of freaked him out. Yeah, so maybe he was given uh, some prestige even there amongst the people because of his color. Or maybe, maybe they killed and ate him because they thought he was of supernatural powers. Right, it could give them some yeah. kind of special you don't, uh, power, right? You don't really know. Or maybe he, like you said, maybe he wanted to to go missing, and that whole thing is. I just have a feeling like if if he would have swam in and found help, he was the guy that was going to bring you help. You know, he's one of those dudes. I'm gonna. I almost feel like he was. He's either dead or he was held against his will until they broke him. Like maybe they put. You know what I mean? Like maybe mm, they do. They right. they put him in a hut. Maybe they feed him some sort of psilocybin, something like that, to where they break him down mentally. You know, who knows what? Maybe the shamans are giving him some stuff till they turn him into you know one of their. Because maybe. You think of this angle, and I just thought of this. What if his, the 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 group that had him, the tribe that had him, knew that another tribe was so fearful of white people, they thought of them as a white devil or you know whatever it is, some sort of of special supernatural creature, and they knew that if they had this guy that came to find them, if they could break him and make him a villager, that they would make their entire village more powerful because they had this dude on their team. Right. Yeah. You know, as dumb as that sounds, I know that sounds ridiculous, but as dumb as that sounds, maybe that's what it is. Yeah. Very interesting. Well, if you'd like to share your stories with Expanded Perspectives, don't forget you can email the show at expandedperspectives at yahoo.com. You can also call the show 817-945-3828. Uh, that's about all time we have here for the free show. For you elite members, we'll be speaking to you on Thursday. For Pretty Lights, Inner Traditions, New Page Books, Ancient American Magazine, I'm Kyle Filson. He's Kim Hale. Peace, y'all.